All right. Well, I'm Brian Redling, professional engineer with APA, and I've been observing damage such as this from hurricanes and tornadoes for the past 20 years with APA. And today we'll discuss some important considerations for designing uh, and can building wood frame buildings to resist the ex uh, extreme forces that are prevalent in these um, natural occurrences, hurricanes and tornadoes. To begin, APA was formed in, in, the 19, in 1933 as the Douglas Fir Plywood Association. So the APA is a nonprofit organization representing now a series of engineered wood products beginning with plywood then oriented strand board. In the early 90s, we began representing the manufacturers of engineered wood products and, and laminated beams such as you see here <laughs> and thus changed our name to APA, the Engineered Wood Association. So our main portal to the designer is the designer circle. This is where you sign up for newsletters and gain access to free literature uh, to address a whole wide range of topics of, uh, related to building design. There are over 400 publications here for uh, different uses. So today we're going to look at seismic and wind forces, mainly wind. We're going to talk about some cost-effective ways to design buildings that are uh, stronger and, and um, you know, can uh, handle some of the tornado occurrences. Tornado myths are going to be discussed. The load path continuity, the key to the building performance as well as wall bracing, shear walls, uh, some of these terminology and the current uh, design methodologies for some of these bracing and shear walls and diaphragms. There's going to be something for everybody here, even you know homeowners if you're interested in uh, performance of your home um, during a, a wind event. So begin with, the building code is starting to refer more and more to outside documents and not so much of the language within the body of the building code. One of these, of course, is the wind loads defined by AASCE 7, a minimum design of loads for buildings. And this gives you all the wind speed maps and this is really the front lines of where the development of wind design is taking place as far as the loads are concerned. The National Design Specification does the same thing for wood except tells you specifically how to design the parts and the connections, uh, the members, the columns, beams, uh, all is spelled out in great detail in the National Design Specification, which again is referred from the IDC. Uh, NDS further is has a segment on uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic as shown here, the 2008 edition uh, was just uh, is, the, is the most recent edition and has um, more specific information about the uh, lateral force uh, load path and design methods. The IBC changed in 2009 to require or make mandatory the 2008 special design provisions uh, in the two, 20, chapter 23. Uh, this special design provisions document by American Wood Council uh, it has some changes that allow a better use of a uh, shear wall design. Unblocked shear walls are now uh, a known entity. Two-sided shear walls. If you're doing perforated shear wall design, there's a new equation, and there's an, a strength limit uh, increase, dramatic uh, strength limit increase for perforated shear walls. We're going to talk about some of that later. It's uh, you know something that engineers and architects use. Um, in engineered areas, a lot of the high wind design is, is done using this method, but it all kind of ties in together with some logic to um, you know, the, our intuition. So that we'll look at some of that as we go. So the 2008, looking to advance this slide. All right. <laughs> Not sure why, but the um, slide is no longer advancing. Okay, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> another snafu. Wood frame construction manual is a document also by American Wood Council, but it's prescriptive in large part with some engineering info included, such as 
you know, column capacities and things that make it easy to design wood buildings. But the cool part about the wood frame construction manual is it's broken into individual wind speeds. So if you're designing a specific wind speed, you can download, say, the 120 mile per hour uh, document, and it's all uh, specific to that wind speed as far as the tabulated information, such as you see here for studs. Uh, in the um, selection of studs, is, for example, the height for a given wind category is, is shown here, uh, the maximum height you know, for a given uh, stud spacing. So furthermore, there are additions of um, what used to be known as the deemed to comply manual SSTD 1093 is now uh, taken over by ICC and is prescriptively uh, providing for the design of single family residence. Typically these are the more modest size homes, you know, not uh, some bigger buildings that need to be engineered. So with that in mind, the prescriptive bracing, you know, which you have in the IRC is limited to three stories and wind speeds of less than 100 miles per hour, except in hurricane regions you can accommodate 110 mile per hour with the IRC. But this technology is more simple. It uses braced wall panels, which are not shear walls te technically because they don't contain hold downs. The engineered shear walls accommodate building size of uh, you know any, any size, any shape, and the wind uh, is uh, up to you know, the, the maximum. 150. So uses shear walls in this case instead of uh, bracing panels which contain hold downs and are more for, as I say, engineered versions of uh, the lateral load pass system. So prescriptive designs for wind speeds over 100 as we saw uh, can be provided by the wood frame construction manual in the IBS uh, 600. So to begin with, uh, changes in architectural design of buildings causes some um, you know, us to be left with less wall space in order to accomplish wall bracing. That's been, you know, I'm sure a topic of uh, the, the four prior bracing uh, discussions, so we won't uh, spend a lot of time on this uh, information, but SR102 is the APA simplified wall bracing method, which assumes a slightly thicker wall sheathing than code minimum, which is 3 8 uh, and a tighter nail schedule than the code minimum 6 and 12. It goes to 4 and 12. This allows narrower wall segments and accounts for size of openings that are larger. Now you can give us partial credit for walls that are too narrow to qualify as a bracing unit. So check that out. If you're doing residential uh, bracing design, this is a go-to document and, uh, by APA available at the website. But the continuous method uh, referred to in the IRC is CSWSP method uh, is part of um, what the APA method uh, attempts to utilize, and that is the continuity provided by continuously sheathed the walls above and below the openings, allows a more um, flexible allows more flexibility in the uh, bracing, you know, accomplishing the bracing um, requirements of the building code. So, you know, what we are trying to attempt is to to build a box, a box that uh, self-supports, the, the walls are perpendicular to each other, brace each other through proper framing uh, uh, laps, uh, the detailing there, and hold down uh, as far as the anchorage. And this building pushed off the foundation by Hurricane Katrina storm surge. You know, the weak link here, obvious, is uh, the anchorage to the foundation, but a lot could be said for the strength of a continuously sheathed box type structure. So. This is covered in our building for high wind resistance. A lot of the information that we're covering in this program is contained in this publication by APA, uh, talking about the load path. And this really just gives prescriptive additions to the IRC. This is a nine-point checklist of time-tested details that have been developed you know, through the years by the wood industry and can be applied prescriptively two IRC compliant buildings. The cool thing is you'll see there's not a whole lot of expensive stuff here. It's uh, metal clips at the rafter to top plate and a larger plate washer at the base to resist the uplift forces down there. But otherwise the wall sheathing is acting in both uplift and uh, to brace the walls laterally. In this case uh, the building you know, can be improved dramatically as far as the strength is concerned without a very large output of, of money. So you know, we'll look at that a little bit more closely later. But the 
engineered load path, what we assume is engineered is, is that you know the, the path of, obviously for vertical loads is pretty direct and the gravity never changes. So that we have an intuition that for the lateral load path, we do not have uh, some more circuitous roundabout way for the load to re reach the foundation. And so there's a more of a challenge. The building code does say well, we have to complete our load path uh, from the point of origin to the resisting elements. And that's the basis for our motivation here, is to get the load off of the building or out of the roof, off the walls, down, flow down through the structure and back down into the foundation eventually. So although this, uh, what might be termed a statically indeterminate structure, it's hard to know exactly where the loads are flowing. We've been able to develop methods uh, empirically through testing that tell us what the impact of these openings are on our building. And um, so this is a very fast way to, say, bridge discontinuities at the floors. Stud-to-stud uh, -stud connections can be made by, um, you know, some intentionality with the lapping of the wall sheeting. And, you know, with the lateral forces being applied to the building uh, with wind, we're the force is equal to the pressure of the wind times the area that it's acting over. And we sum all of these pressures on the building. Uh, and those lateral forces have to be resisted by the roof uh, system. It's a big rectangular plate that's made by fastening the roof sheathing to the framing members uh, to keep it rigid, to keep it from racking. Same with the wall. It's made from framing members with enough sheathing and enough nails to keep it from turning into a parallelogram as the load is applied. So uh, not only that, but we have these pressures that, as you see here, the windward wall is in red. is a positive pressure pushing in on the wall and uh, negative pressures on other portions of the building. But flying debris might cause, say, a window to be breached on the windward side. That positive pressure suddenly is exerted on the interior of the building. Uh, combining uh, in an instant with the negative pressures. This can cause buildings to explode, you know, with a rapid type of failure, or portions of the building to explode, and we'll see some examples. Here, seismic is um, not any difference than the lateral uh, resistance in the, in the, the building doesn't know whether it's an earthquake or a, or a um, or high wind, but the force uh, is applied to the building differently through seismic ground motion, the force is equal to mass times the acceleration of the ground. The mass of wood buildings being low is a real attribute, plus the very redundant and energy absorbing uh, systems can be created you know, through uh, proper detailing. So this is um, an example of forces being applied to the building in three different directions. You just get a bunch of guys, uh, grad students, measuring uh, seismic forces going down the road, bumpy, curvy, twisty and turny slamming on brakes from time to time, you get the idea it loads in three directions uh, that can be uh, very detrimental and uh, catastrophic for buildings that are, are not able to absorb the energy applied to the building. So that's the plus for wood is it's light, flexible, highly redundant with a good balance of strength and, and stiffness so that we can um, absorb the energy as the the seismic event occurs. It's a lot of energy to de be dissipated. With wind, you know, many of us are in areas where the tornado um, comes along. You know, from time to time, we hear news about severe events such as this F5, and these are very uh, rare. The types of uh, damage that are experienced here are, are severe. But as you move away from the vortex, Wind speeds die down dramatically. Um, as you can see, with the enhanced Fujita scale, the EF scale, we rate tornadoes from an EF zero. These are pretty benign, 65 to 85 miles per hour, uh, down to the EF five, you know, up to 300 miles per hour. But the interesting part is the EF two through EF zero are the wind speeds that are more or less represented in the building code. You know, for uh, we have ways to easily design for EF2 and below. And if you look at the percentage of occurrence, the EF2 and below represents almost 96% of all tornadoes. So there is a lot of uh, rational uh, or, or good reasoning for designing for buildings uh, 
for some exposure to these wind, wind events. Most, uh, the, I guess the biggest um, misunderstanding uh, is that you know, there's nothing you can do to survive a tornado, but the truth is uh, you know, that 70% of all tornadoes, a lot of them are 110 or less. And the damaging winds, even in a higher uh, rated tornado, are slower uh, than as you get towards the periphery. So unrealistic to protect against the EF3 through EF5, uh, very rare events. Uh, so these recommendations provide basic uh, recommendations for protecting the building's shell. <clears throat> and as you see, this is a um, pretty large picture of northern Alabama and northern Georgia as uh, the super outbreak Tuscaloosa tornado passed along. You can see that a lot of variation here in the EF scale. We're going to zoom into the circled area. This is a very detailed ground study done to determine the, the F scale of the tornado in this vicinity. And it was a pretty severe uh, EF4 in some of the locations, but uh, during the ground survey, it was determined that um, in the area of impact, that more area was affected by EF1 and EF0 and EF2 than the more severe 3 and 4. So, you know, even the homes built in the area impacted would have uh, fared better had some attention to this technology been paid. And in some cases, it has been. Uh, I'm going to show you some photos later where uh, some buildings were built with this in mind. Uh, the uh, area percentages here in that study area here showed 31 percent it was EF1. Um, so the, the points that are covered in the building for highland resistance are roof sheeting attachment. We want to make sure we've got enough nails in there to keep the um, negative pressure from pulling off the roof sheeting. Gable end connections. This ties the bottom of the, the um, truss into the top of the wall. Uh, at the place where a hinge point occurs in our framing system, otherwise, a cladding attachment of the wall sheathing and the siding uh, has to resist negative pressures. And we'll see some failures there as well. Roof to wall connection, the most vulnerable uh, area for catastrophic roof failure is this simple connection. Wall to wall continuity, wall sheathing attachment, of course, has to resist the negative pressures. And then we take the wall sheathing all the way down to the sill plate and then bolt that to the foundation, and that's really where the uh, terminus of our loads uh, lies. Roof sheathing attachment, we can attain some higher performance using deformed shank nails. These can be spiral shank or um, ring shank. Uh, we'd like to see them at uh, higher, you know, used in more numbers, six on center along intermediate framing and four inches on center on the panel ends is a good uh, application for a ring shank nail if you really want to uh, survive a high wind event. Here you see standard uh, roof sheathing loss uh, at the gable end. This is an area of high pressure. The sheathing cantilevers past the gable end wall. It's so just an, high, an area of vulnerability where the attachment can be achieved more uh, efficiently with a deformed shank nail. And some of these uh, wind rated fasteners have larger heads for greater pull through resistance. So not a code requirement, but a good idea. One challenge, if you've seen these step-down trusses, the wood uh, step-down trusses in this case have a top core that is horizontal, or the nailing surface is horizontal. The roof sheathing is sloped. So there presents some challenges here with the alignment of the roof sheathing and where the fastener is placed. Not only that, but the roof sheathing has to change directions in this case. So a good system is to use purlins on top of step-down trusses and then your sheathing doesn't have to change direction. And it has a, a flush nailing surface. So that's a vulnerability for the truss systems. The gable end here, not connected well to the roof sheathing at the top and at the bottom, not supported well by the uh, floor system of this bonus room. You can see the lateral connection there was uh, inadequate. We try to uh, tie these gable ends back using a system of a strap uh, connected to a two by that runs along the top of the ceiling joist. So this is just a way to give lateral restraint at a, at a spacing of about six feet on center to that gable end to support the top of your gable end wall. 
the top of the gable end wall and the bottom of the gable end truss is a real vulnerable area. This is common uh, to see that type of failure on a gable roof. The component and cladding loads given in the IRC are shown here. You can see some of these in the 120, 130 zone or negative 30, 40 pounds per square foot, uh, depending on the effective wind area. But these component and cladding loads have you know, some reasons behind them because the uh, coverings for walls and roofs are subjected to these negative pressure. Again, we see on the left some step-down trusses, a common area of failure, uh, loss of roof sheeting there because of difficulty attachment, attaching the, to the roof framing. And then to the right, some siding, uh, non-structural sheathing there on the gable end wall. You can see the gable end, in this case, has no gypsum on the inside. Uh, obviously, it's the attic. And the, below, we have gypsum on the inside. So you know, that building probably uh, lost the, the um, or you know, failed because of the absence of anything on the inside of the wall and a non-structural sheathing above. So we have a publication, TT105, that covers this, giving fastening recommendations for various wind speed and wind exposure categories if you're interested in the um, information there. Just uh, go into our publications area of the web page and type in TT105. The resistance on the component and cladding uh, is typically just uh, fasteners eight inches, uh, four inches on center at the perimeter and six inches along the intermediate framing that's above the code minimum just to uh, resist that negative pressure that we see has caused some uh, gable end uh, failures at the roof level. This typically is accompanied by large amounts of water infiltration and uh, heavily damaged uh, from a monetary standpoint. The uplift forces due to the uh, passage of wind over the top surface of the roof can be significant. You know, so these uplift forces have to be transferred down to the bottom and to the foundation. The first step is to get the whole roof and you know, wall connected so that the uh, force can be transferred down uh, vertically. Uh, these toenails are pretty um, inadequate in most cases for resisting loads in the vertical direction because they're loaded in withdrawal. So part of our high wind recommendations are to use a framing anchor. Uh, the best types are those designed for loads in all three directions whereby the loads are applied to the fastener perpendicular to the fastener shank and not loading those in the weak direction or in withdrawal. You know, we see also the use of these structural screws uh, can be used to supplement the capacity of a light gauge metal connector in the case uh, where the connectors are, are not strong enough. That's something we see on, in the high wind areas. Uh, but also, you know, can be used to go above code minimum without using a, a light gauge connector. Uh, also, as you move down to uh, the foundation in your wall system, you're going to have transfer of, of force into the uh, stud material, then into the wall sheeting, crossing over the uh, bridging over the floor system here, down into the wall system below. So. We were, are relying on the continuity of the wall sheathing uh, to carry the uplift force here. Uh, and if you want to get into some of the engineering, if you're doing an engineer design, you would refer to the publication E510, Use of Wood Structural Panels for Combined Uplift and Shear Resistance. This gives you a way to engineer, say, a, a building that doesn't meet the prescriptive uh, limitations of the IRC. Uh, what this uh, technology does is eliminates you know, framing uh, connectors that uh, would interrupt our ability to fasten the sidings or, or the sheathing to the wall system and reduces construction time by eliminating hardware. Also, we have numerous APA producers of oversized wall sheathing. Uh, this attempts to bridge from the bottom plate or the sill plate all the way up to the rim board and then another row of sheathing from there to the top plate of the second floor, eliminating blocking that would otherwise be needed horizontal joints, uh, easy to inspect, and shows less air, air infiltration uh, under testing in, in the situations where you've got uh, less joints for air infiltration to occur in. Uh, wall sheathing, if used for uplift, we have to 
and make sure that in the areas where there's not enough wall, say between these two uh, windows, we would need to uh, put additional metal connectors there to carry the uplift force um, from the uh, collected along the headers of these two window openings. So the first method uh, that can be used in this uh, methodology E510 is to lap the sheathing over the floor system and to transfer the tension at the studs that would be located at the horizontal blocking somewhere near the mid-height of the wall. Uh, then additional fasteners are, are placed in the framing above and below the floor system between the perimeter nailing. This is uh, you know, at the intermediate, intermediate framing members. Another possibility is to lap the sheathing at the, horse, at the uh, rim board, and then you can place additional fasteners above and below uh, simply into the rim board at the horizontal joint. There's a lot of uh, locations there, plenty of room to add additional fasteners for the uplift portion. If you're simply designing for the lateral force, then additional fasteners are placed uh, above and below the, the joint to provide the uplift uh, transfer and the uplift force uh, of the uh, carried in the wood structural panel. The rim board that you see here is a great uh, use uh, for that uh, lap at the floor system. In this case, the uh, rim board has a published design capacity in the vertical direction, tension perpendicular to the member length. Now, it's not the case with, say, lumber. Uh, in the case of uh, lumber, let me go back. In the case of a lumber rim board, well, there is a, another detail that shows a splice where you just move your rim board back and use a wood structural panel splice plate there. Okay, so that's uh, E510. We um, also want to encourage the continuous sheathing of, of all walls with wood structural panels because of the uh, limitations of walls that are braced intermittently uh, where the non-structural portions really create a lot of discontinuity for the lateral system. So I'm going to show you some examples of that as we go through. But here is the, the other end of the spectrum. This uh, community in Pleasant Grove, Alabama was impacted by a tornado in the late 90s. So this area was rebuilt with some more attention to the details, uh, more structural uh, connectors. And, and these, this whole uh, development was very um, strongly impacted by the super outbreak in 2011, the same as the Tuscaloosa storm. Uh, just to the northeast of Tuscaloosa. And you can see fence posts are sticking up here, no fence boards left. The tree is stripped mainly of, uh, of small limbs. So, you know, we could say this is an EF3. Buildings perform pretty well. This is another view of the same neighborhood. Um, you know, very uh, severe impact from the wind, but uh, pretty good performance considering, the, you know, the, um, the, severe, the severity of this storm. Uh, you know, just because the siding is, uh, you know, supposedly durable, that uh, often is an imperception. You know, when brittle materials are impacted by flying debris, you know, you really don't get a very good performance. Flying debris is something that has to be considered. The windows and doors are impacted severely, and the pressurization and the loss of, you know, the monetary loss in a storm like this, much of it uh, can be the result. Of, of breaches and, and holes in the building. And this building is simply uh, uh, braced uh, with intermittent bracing. It's a fairly small home with uh, one story and X, or, or excuse me, there's a, a wood structural panel shown here at the left. That's the, the corner bracing. The rest of the building is uh, not, has a non-structural sheathing there. So, but this is a pretty light wind. You see buildings adjacent with very little damage, uh, trees relatively intact. Um, and here's the corner bracing, just an up close look at that. And it has a drywall on the inside. And um, in the, uh, on the other side of the same home, you see the portion that uh, came out is the non-structural sheathing. It just kind of gives you some indications of, you know, what kind of forces uh, buildings have to be uh, prepared to handle. In this particular uh, doghouse you see here fully sheathed with plywood uh, might uh, be a good indication for the way we should head. With the 
uh, the end of our load really is to get the load down into the to the sill plate. So we want to extend extend the wood structural panel sheathing to the sill plate, fasten to the sill plate, and bolt that sill plate down uh, with an adequate uh, fastener. Here you see wall sheathing. Everything is in place here to build a strong building. Uh, it just so happens that some of these uh, you know details, which don't cost any more, uh, were not followed. This wall sheathing here was not really fastened at the bottom very well, um, and the uh, sill plate was not even really uh, enlisted in in, pull, in holding down the, the building in this case. Uh, here you see fasteners located much too far apart uh, and uh, no attachment to the sill plate. So there's no real rationale used in the, the, the construction of this home. Another home, pretty light winds, see the trees, there's not a broken one. Uh, the garage door in this case may have been open, may have gotten blown in, but that's the area where the building became pressurized pushing out the walls to the left and collapsing the building towards the rear. Uh, here you see the wall on the left. It has uh, very little attachment to the bottom plate. The bottom plate has partially failed. It's rotated slightly, but uh, you can see anchor bolts about six feet on center with the minimal sized washers really don't offer a whole lot of resistance to uh, the forces trying to pull the sill plate up. So what we really want to see uh, with for an enhanced wind uh, resistance is to use a bottom plate um, uh, washer that will hold more of the material down. The more material you can restrain with the washer, the better the performance is. So we've determined in our testing at APA on these connectors that uh, for an average uh, IRC building, you want to use these anchor bolts 32 to 48 inches on center as, a, as an enhancement. And it's kind of reverse engineering you know, that we did to, to determine the anchor bolt spacing. What is the amount of anchor bolts that we need with a big plate washer to hold down fully sheathed building with uh, you know, the APA recommendations? And that's kind of how we arrived at that. But of course, the anchor bolts with no washers or minimal size washers are not uh, as effective at holding the bottom plate down as a larger 3 by 3 plate washer. These are a common piece of hardware in high seismic areas. So it's a, not something difficult to achieve. Uh, you can even order them from Amazon. I've priced them. The wall sheathing on the left here, so, uh, 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 we're looking at the sill plate, but the wall sheathing is in uplift. The fasteners into the sill plate uh, are lifting up on the sill plate, and it just uh, works good to have that plate washer below this area where the fasteners are located. Uh, essentially, this um, is, is a, a vast improvement. And you can m use uh, your uh, anchor bolt set at this lower uh, spacing. And you know, really, if you don't uh, anchor your building, then what do you have? If you, you know, have a really strong building with poor anchorage, it's um, not going to really help. So here we see a building might be pretty strong um, to the left here, but not anchored well to the foundation. The building is shifted back off the foundation. And look at the trees, folks. This is probably an EF0. This is a gust of wind that moved the building about six feet off of the foundation. The foundation has very poor anchorage. They had attempted to fasten the bottom plate, or the sill plate, rather, to the foundation using um, steel pins. We see this occasionally also in Coling, Alabama. This is the super outbreak tornado. Foundation anchorage here was, uh, again, steel pins, uh, power actuated fasteners used in, uh, to shoot the bottom plate to the slab. But uh, you know these are not effective if they're not used in abundance. Um, the fastener here, of course, pulled through the bottom plate. Many of the fasteners I observed were bent and not uh, penetrating into the concrete. This building, the entire building is swept clean um, in an area. Uh, it was hit at 5 a.m., about 5.20 a.m. Folks here were asleep, uh, as were many of the folks that are impacted uh, in this um, the super outbreak. Uh, were, they were unprepared because it was, it was dark, and they didn't have an alarm system. Uh, but uh, testing 
to that goes behind this, uh, you know, the technology we're talking about is backed up through our systems report, uh, designing for sure enough that where we loaded anchor bolts uh, at different various spacings at the bottom, in up, uplift and shear, and these uh, values are tabulated. So if you need to go in and engineer something, you can find your allowable design uplift and then determine your anchor bolt spacings based on this table. Okay, but you know, in general, the lateral forces on a building uh, is first carried in the roof diaphragm. That's just a big square plate on the top of our building to keep the building uh, from racking or becoming a parallelogram. We can analyze our roof diaphragm as if it were flat. Uh, we get a conservative result, uh, even if the building has a, a sloped roof. It's easier to uh, analyze it as flat, and you can assume that is a conservative analysis. Unblocked roofs, uh, roof diaphragms, and, um, and walls and floors are not as strong as a blocked diaphragm where we see the uh, blocking applied along all the panel edges. There's more shear transfer capability within this floor system, for example. So if you need enhanced uh, diaphragm values, you can block these. Uh, shear walls and uh, bracing panels are assumed to be blocked in most cases, except as I mentioned earlier, we have unblocked shear walls adjustment factors now in the um, American Wood Council s uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic. It's based on cyclic testing um, and gives you some adjustment factors for unblocked shear walls. If you're designing or engineering shear walls, there's two ways to do it. This is fun stuff for anybody that's uh, kind of a geek like me. With a flexible diaphragm, that's where your diaphragm is more than twice the flexibility of your shear wall. Um, this means that you can use the flexible analysis with a rigid diaphragm. You can assume uh, the diaphragm is stiff uh, relative to the shear walls. But it, the difference is, and you can look at it either way, the building code's uh, only uh, very clear in one area. And that is for rigid diaphragms, um, you must use the uh, rigid analysis for open-ended buildings or buildings with a cantilever diaphragm. But um, essentially, you're not limited on uh, most normal uh, buildings such as this. Uh, three with a, uh, three uh, shear walls, in this case, the diaphragm, if it's a flexible diaphragm, distributes the loads to the three shear walls according to the tributary area, like a simply supported beam analysis, where you would have 25% of your load on the outside walls and 50 on that interior shear wall. With the uh, comparing that with the rigid analysis, where we distribute the load to the shear walls according to the shear wall stiffness. In this case, all three shear walls are identical. Uh, a third of the load goes into each shear wall. So that changes a lot when you get into buildings with different configurations such as this. Uh, the middle shear wall is only half as stiff. So with a rigid analysis, uh, we're going to see only 20% of the load to the interior shear wall. That really is a better uh, scenario uh, for the case that we have since we don't have as much shear wall at the interior of the building and, you know, compared to a flexible where half of the load is going into this shorter wall that's uh, not as good an analysis, uh, and we get the, the uh, you know, legitimate results can be obtained with either flexible or the rigid analysis. And as I said, cantilevered diaphragms, open-ended buildings must use the rigid uh, method for to account for the torsion. Uh, more information can be uh, obtained at the uh, APA website on the, in the diaphragms and shear walls uh, design uh, publication there. But the shear transfer in this uh, image from the roof diaphragm to the shear wall has something kind of missing there. We've got uh, had an engineer call this flippy floppy. You know, there's not anything to keep the ceiling joists from racking. Uh, the IRC has just become uh, you know, verbal about this with uh, 2012 IRC. We've got some blocking requirements that are being uh, added to uh, systems where the space between the top the uh, top plate of the wall and the roof seating, if that's more than nine and a half inches, then some type of um, bridging, uh, X bracing has to be used there to prevent that. You can see bridging is used here between rafters. Rafters are attached uh, 
through uh, these metal connectors, but the lateral force that uh, is carried in the diaphragm, the yellow portion here, the, the roof sheathing, has to make it down into the shear wall, and that's part of the, the need for blocking there is to provide the shear transfer into the top of our shear walls. As the uh, shear walls are loaded, we have overturning forces. This is the case for shear walls as well as bracing. Uh, it just so happens that bracing is not required to be designed to, to re be restraining this overturning. But for engineered walls, we have these hold down anchors, as you see here, to resist the overturning of the shear walls um, as the load is applied. We have to use a rational analysis, you know, in the case of an engineered building. Now, large uh, four or five story buildings, we have a, a threaded rod system here with a, actually a self-tightening hold down connector to the left here with um, just to accommodate shrinkage in the building height. As that becomes loose, um, you know, the hold down forces are not very effectively transferred to the foundation. We take those loads to the foundation in the case of multi-story buildings, typically through a threaded rod system. Uh, and here you see the tension is carried by the threaded rod, but the compression side of the shear wall system is carried by these timbers, uh, which are, you know, in a tall, five-story buildings such as this are, are pretty significant forces. Um, the building code says you can use 60 percent of the dead load to resist overturning uh, from wind or earthquake. That helps in the overturning uh, calculation. We see here the shear wall has the overturning hold down connectors at the start and the stop. Uh, other aspects of the shear wall performance include the stud species, the Denser species have a higher shear wall design value. The nail size and spacing has a, an effect. More nails around the perimeter, bigger nails around the perimeter of the panel give the panel more uh, racking resistance. Uh, we see minimum fastening along the intermediate framing here, however. Uh, also, the thicker panel up to 5 8 inch thickness gives you more capacity uh, for carrying lateral forces. However, be aware that the structural one grades shown in the building code are typically only available in the western U.S. where the high diaphragm capacities are, are needed. Okay, so you know, when we are designing shear walls, the um, limitation for width is the height of the shear wall uh, divided by 3.5 is the minimum width. For seismic, it's the height divided by 2. So you've got at least 4 foot of uh, wall length that you need for seismic design except a penalty can be applied to a seismic design of three and a half to one. We'll see that. We're going to look at, a, at an example. But the code authors in uh, the 2006 IBC determined that there was a, a higher uh, predictability of the loads for wind design and decided that was able, we were able to reduce the factor of safety for wind design by uh, basically 40 percent. The code authors uh, decided to use the uh, an application of a 1.4 increase for uh, wind design with no increase for seismic design for the um, the current shear wall tables. So there's a difference uh, in wind also uh, in that with wind design you can add dissimilar materials within a shear wall, not the case with seismic design. So when we look at wind versus seismic, you'll see that uh, the wind is getting some bumps here, strength can be added by the gypsum, but the seismic design really only has a penalty. And if we look at a, you know, this, an example, this, this is an uh, eight foot tall, two uh, foot three, shear wall 716 OSB with eight D nails, three and 12, and gypsum on the opposite face. Uh, when we compare the wind capacity, the tabulated value 450 times the 40% increase, plus uh, gypsum is 100 pounds per linear foot, times the length of the wall, 1640. With seismic, we're only uh, reducing the 450 by the factor of um, two times the, uh, width, the, the width times the height, over the height. So that's uh, quite a difference, 1640 pounds versus 570 pounds for the same shear wall in a seismic design. Uh, how about using adhesives? We get this question all the time. Can we use uh, adhesive to increase the uh, structural uh, capacity of our shear wall. Uh, you know, the, the, even though it's theoretically possible, it's difficult to achieve because of the variability in site applied adhesives and the fact that the adhesive is a more rigid connection and 
uh, would have to fail really before the nails ever see any of the load. Uh, for this reason, it's, this is prohibited actually in high seismic areas, uh, but there's no real uh, accepted methodology for using adhesives to increase shear capacity. Uh, Site-built portal frames are a tool that you need to be aware of for narrow sections. Uh, buildings can be engineered with uh, site-built solutions. Uh, here you see the engineered version with hold downs located um, on the uh, sides of the, the vertical portion, but most of the strength is being achieved as moment connections, both by lapping the wall sheathing with the header at the top and uh, having a, a, a hold down, 4,200 pound hold down strap on both sides of this narrow segment. So this engineered version of the portal frame is covered in technical port report TT100, but gives design capacities for this rigid frame that can be built around an opening. Uh, we can also use the same, ter uh, uh, the same technology to match uh, the needs of, of buildings that are prescriptively braced, and this is a bracing unit to the left of the diagram uh, where the capacity is achieved through the lapping of the wall sheathing with the extended header. Uh, and the base of the uh, method known in the IRC is continuously sheathed portal frame, or CSPF, um, allows you to brace buildings with as little as a 16 inch return wall. So you know that's uh, going to be necessary in cases where you have large openings such as garages. I want to kind of end things up here with a discussion of shear wall design in high wind areas. You know, this is going to be uh, a part of your rationale is uh, you know looking at the um, flow of numbers within your shear wall systems. If you don't have a building that meets the bracing requirements, then you may need to engineer. Uh, so one of the uh, methods is the segmented approach where we ignore portions of the wall above and below window and door openings. This divides our uh, wall system into a series of segment uh, or shear wall segments. Um, another method has been developed to continuously uh, brace laterally. This is known as the force transfer method where you're considering this wall as one continuous shear wall. Uh, the beauty of that is you've only got a hold down on the start and stop. Uh, you know, we don't have a hold down on each uh, segment of the shear wall. Uh, this is a little bit more cumbersome, a lot more engineering is involved in determining the force transfer around these openings. And you can see a metal strap has been used here to help transfer the force. As compared to a really more user-friendly design method, the perforated method gives you a capacity adjustment for your shear wall based on the size and number of openings in your continuously sheathed wall. So we're going to look at that. The reason that this is important is the uh, hold down connectors that would be required for a segment of design could be numerous, as shown on the left, where a continuous method allows the elimination of a lot of the intermediate hold down locations. And it kind of makes more sense uh, for constructability. So the segmented approach here is represented with a portion above and below the window in red is not really a part of our calculation. We're just using these as two shear walls and that gives us four hold downs, more of an antiquated approach. With the force transfer method, uh, one of the advantages besides um, eliminating uh, hold downs is that you can reduce the the width of the wall system and in this case the height to width ratio applies only to the the wall pier or the portion that's in light uh, color so you can really get it some very narrow segments since your you know your height is only the the pier height uh, and we we compare this with the perforated method uh, this is a place where we really don't pay any attention to detailing around the openings. We just sheathe above and below the openings, and the openings are accounted for through this adjustment factor, uh, shear capacity adjustment factor, SCAF. So the hold downs are only at the ends. Uh, this methodology has been expanded from what was formerly limited to 490. Now we can do up to 1370 for wind and 980 for seismic. Here we see the shear capacity adjustment factors uh, in the table, 
that give you uh, a different factor depending on the percent of the height, of full height sheathing, the percent of the wall that has full height sheathing, and the maximum height of the openings. So we can pull out an adjustment factor from that table, or we can use this calculation. Uh, the beauty of the calculation is that it accounts for the uh, actual size of each opening, whereas the tabulated value assumes all the openings are the same size. So there's a little bit of detail there on the perforated method and some, some of the rationale behind it. Uh, if you have more, uh, you know, need more information here, uh, great publications are shown here. The shear walls and diaphragms is the engineered uh, guide for designing uh, for your lateral load systems. The simplified wall bracing publication, SR102, shown here in the middle, and then our high wind details, which gives a benchmark, really, for builders and designers to use to um, attempt to offer something ab above code minimum to uh, you know the, the, the person that's going to be uh, purchasing or living in a, in a particular building. So with that, I uh, just want to encourage you to use the APA website, sign up for the APA Designer Circle in order to receive uh, all these uh, publications for free and a, a newsletter which will keep you updated. If you have any more questions, you can feel free to contact me at the APA uh, address here or our help desk is very useful for designers that need a, uh, help with a lot of the more common uh, issues that are uh, confronting with, uh, designers today. So it's a great resource for, for folks like you and uh, at this point I guess I'm just going to turn it back over to Steve and let's take some questions. All right, Brian, thanks. So far I don't see any hands raised, but we do have a couple questions that were written in. Uh, one comes from Allen in Maryland. On a relatively steep gabled roof, can a wall-designed diaphragm system reduce the need for deep ridge beams and or collar ties? Well, the um, question it seems to be related to the uh, elimination of beams at the ridge uh, and collar ties. That really is resisted. That lateral uh, force at the top of the walls should be resisted by the ceiling diaphragm and not through uh, the exterior walls or any of the wall bracing. So you, know, you typically are going to need a ridge beam or collar ties when the, uh, of course, the collar ties are, are meant to keep the ridge from opening up kind of like a doctor's bag. So the collar ties can be eliminated by using a metal strap across the, the ridge point, uh, but the horizontal thrust at the base of the rafters uh, really needs to rely on a ceiling uh, framing or a ceiling diaphragm. But that's a great question. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, another question from Stan says, is it possible to download a copy of the slides used in today's presentation? Yes. I've I can accommodate that request. If uh, anyone would like to receive a copy of the slides, they can just simply email me at brian.redlingapawood.org. But Brian, thank you again. And, My uh, pleasure. Thank you, Steve. You got it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.